Welcome, everyone. Welcome back, I should say. Welcome back to the Body Meets Mind podcast. Uh, as always, I'm with my good friend and confidant. Uh, I've never called you a confidant, but look, we'll, we'll roll with it. <laughs> Paulie, right. how are you, mate? I was going to say sous chef, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever whatever works, whatever rolls. Yeah. Guten Tag, young man. How are you? I'm well, sir. I'm well. I uh, I wasn't planning on um, going for the moustache. But uh, I went for the moustache. I, I thought I'd go a little bit shorter here, and um, and then I knew there was said, something uh, happening. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but now I see it. And I yes. was, and subconsciously, I was picturing you in a uh, in a one piece leotard with one of those right. barbells with bulbous balls <laughs> on the. End. So now yeah. I know why I was picturing that. Yeah, John McStrong from the nineteen thirty six <laughs> Olympics. Heave ho! <laughs> yeah. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't um I wasn't going to, but um oh well, my partner likes the movie Top Gun, so I thought I'd just call roll with it. I like it. And just just call yourself Rooster. I will start calling myself Rooster. Yeah, he's not a, that I was a good looking rooster, I'll tell you right now. I was gonna say not not that I uh had never called myself that previously. <laughs> <laughs> well have you have you seen Whiplash? Uh, no, pre- I've not seen it. Oh my god, he is like Oh, uh, hang on. Is that about the drummer? Yeah. Yes, I've seen that amazing movie. And he's he he's the main star in that. Um, and he, that's just a mind blowing film. Really, yeah. really film. That that is actually a movie that I would love to do a podcast on. Um, at one point, mate, that whole, you know, how much you're willing to sacrifice for your dreams, and you know, mm-hmm. it's a very interesting. It's a very very. It, it, there's there's deeper meaning and theme to that to themes to that movie. It sure is. And I, you know, I speak to a lot of elite sportsmen, well, some elite sportsmen from time to time in, you know, in the the history of um, the world. Yes. And I've I've been able to kind of dive into what natural talent gets you gets you to a certain extent versus how much you actually need to sacrifice or invest. And it's a lot, man. And if you take in to the equation, a, uh, a tyrannical, toxic relationship like the one in Whiplash, that can be completely soul destroying, and uh, it can do some real damage. Mm. Uh, it really is amazing. It's um, you know, I like um Tim Grover's um ideas about success and and winning. You know, he he was the coach for Kobe and Michael Jordan, and um, as far as I could ascertain, his whole idea around success and winning was that. Most people can do it, you know. It's just that most people aren't willing to give up what you need to give up to do it. And we're talking not just getting up early every once in a while. It's not even not even not seeing your friends. It's how about just not having any friends? Mm. And just because you can't maintain friendships when everything you do is about winning an NBA championship or becoming the best golfer in the world or what have you. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's hard to, it's one of those things where it's hard to know because it's like there's only one Michael Jordan and Michael Jordan did it a certain way, right? And he did it by sacrificing a shitload. Yes. And uh, cancelling a lot out of his life and taking whatever thousands, hundreds of thousands free throws to be able to get to where he was. And he was like a, like insanely focused, highly competitive person to the point of being a sociopath to a certain degree, you know, but that's what it took for Michael Jordan to become Michael Jordan. Mm, mm, Exactly. Could he he have done it another way? We won't know because he did it this way. And uh, there are other people that have tried it other ways with their faculties and they didn't get there. So, but, you know, like one thing we do know, even from a physiological standpoint, if you want to become a highly specialized athlete at a, in, down a p- particular path that often comes at the behest of other physical attributes. You know, you'll be like an amazing footballer or let, let's use something less generalist than football, like, um, like a goal, like a tennis player, for example, yeah. right. Um, you will become amazing at that, but you're not going to be, the most well weighted uh, athlete as a result of that, because you were choosing to go down a path of specialization. Right. 
Right. Yeah. And it is when you get that lovely mix of, you know, I, I have a hard time with this idea of natural talent more as opposed to natural phenotypes. You know, mm. I mean, if Michael Jordan was five foot two, I doubt he'd have been Michael Jordan, you know, um, no, no, no. <laughs> you just, you just, it'd, it'd be Muggsy Bogues. It, right. I was gonna say <laughs> Nate Robinson, but you know, there's uh, you know, you could, you could do it. Um, but uh, you know, so there is some genetic proclivity for success with just being, just having good genes for whatever you do, you know, mm. even in our world, you know, back in the weightlifting world, people that have really long torsos and really, really short legs are naturally well equipped to deadlift. You know, yep. they can stay quite tall. They don't have to hinge. Their hamstring flexibility doesn't need to be as good as, as someone else's, say, say mine, for mm -hmm. example. Um, um, not that mine is actually that good at all, but um, it's uh, it's one of those things. But 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 dedication can take you so much much further, you know, than what you're given. Yeah, one hundred percent. And like a perfect example is uh, Christian Petrarca, who, for those of you who are listening, who are not um, Australian, he's like consistently in the top three AFL footballers going around for the last three years. And the reason he is consistently in the top three AFL footballers in the last three years is because three to four years ago, he made a decision to devote every ounce of his being to becoming the best footballer he could possibly be. Now, when he was getting drafted, he was touted as the most gifted footballer around natural talent, an incredibly powerful human being. But for the first a few years of his career, some would say that he didn't dedicate to the craft as much as he could have. And he had these flashes of brilliance in, in a season, but it was not enough for that consistency. So that, that natural talent just, I think it gets shown time and time again. It does not get you to places that if you're competing against people that, like you said before, that sacrifice their social life, that sacrifice everything else in their life to be able to become the best specialist that they can possibly be, um, you, you need to have that natural talent and then you need to complement it with this relentless dedication. Yeah. Yeah. You know, man, I think um, this, this might be a good topic for us to continue on. Um, we, we had initially started um, with plans to talk about something else, but w w we might bring that to you guys um, in another show. But, but, but really, if we, we, we go down this rabbit hole of, of natural talent, success, what it takes to achieve your goals, um, it, it, yeah, it's, it, it is, you know, aligned with what you're talking about there with Chris Petrarca. And he's got some real kind of Scott Penelope vibes now, you know, yep. it, it, the game slows down around him, you know, sorry, he yep. slows down around the game. He can control the the time dynamic and he's just got so much more time to make a decision because he's so good at making decisions, but he wouldn't have been able to do that on natural talent alone. And he has now said, you know what, I'm, I'm throwing everything I can at this. I'm going to take it to the next step to see how much further I get. And um, yeah. and credit to him, he he he's been able to do that, but but it is it is about you know, and this comes back into a lot of the stuff you and I have discussed. We'll continue to discuss on this podcast, shifting those identities. You know, if I do, I want to be a great AFL player, or do I want to be one of the best who's ever lived? Well, mm -hmm. what do the people who are the best that has ever lived do? And how can I do more of that? Which means how can I give up some of the stuff that unfortunately is really enjoyable. If you mm. want to be the best, it has to be at, to the sacrifice of everything else. Mm. And uh, you, you, sorry, I do. No, you no, continue. I'm done. done. You, you, you're right. And, you know, it's that whole 10,000 hours, um, uh, you know, discussion that, that, that comes up. And, you know, I played a lot of music when I was younger and I played for this fun, like I played a few gigs for this function band called the Baker Boys and, they did weddings and uh, bar mitzvahs and all that kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. But the cool thing was is, and I am by no means, at, not not 10,000 hours for me on the, on the bass guitar, but I was amongst musicians that were young, 
as I was young back then. But they were so devoted to their craft that the way this Baker Boys um, uh, set up is set up is you don't rehearse as a band. You've got a bass player. You, you basically get a phone call or an inbox on your email and you say, be at this place at this time. This is the set list. These, you don't even, I don't even think you get the keys that, that they're going to be played in. You just rock up and you wow. play the shit, right? Wow. And I just, you know, I was scared shitless because, <laughs> because, you know, and I rock up and I'm speaking to the drummer who I've seen around the, the music scene quite a bit. And, uh, you know, he's just utterly devoted to his craft, you know, um, amongst all the other musicians that I was playing with as I was sitting there like shivering in a corner <laughs> somewhere. But these guys just rock up, never met each other and they just know that they're going to play a shit hot set mm. for um for, for people celebrating uh and and, and that com- that that comes to that ten thousand hours yeah. that someone can be able to um you know like really really indulge in, in in a craft it's being able to put the time in but also on top of that if you were to play you can create parallels between playing music with other people and also playing f- a competitive sport with other athletes. It's like you have the time and 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 the skill and the, the rehearsals in your own locker to be able to bring to the table, and then you have the trust to be able to place in those people around you to be able to get this magic. And let's just continue to go along with the analogy of music. You know, this jazz explosion where this, there's this interplay between bass guitarist and drummer and guitarist and keyboardist, and there's just music happening. That's the same thing that's happening on the football field, on the mm-hmm. basketball uh, court, you know. There's 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 this um, freestyle, this yeah. interplay, because you trust the other people to be able to call and receive and, uh, you know, interchange with all of these different kind of um, communications. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, and, you know, you see passages of playing football as well that are just beautiful. You know, the, the players have just, it's like they've just, you know, there's that common expression. Um, it's like they're just training, you know, because they're just so well versed with what they're doing. And it's just one beautiful contested mark after another, you know, great handballing onto the forward. It's it's awesome. And, and you know, even even in, in, in my craft and writing, there's a really good active participation and a dance that you can have with your reader. You know, if you, if you, you don't want to just tell the reader everything, especially when you're writing a novel, mm. you know, or something that's um, not nonfiction, you want them to be engaged. And Hemingway was brilliant at this and he would often leave parts out just to make sure that the reader was just trying, you know, it, it almost, he, the way he kind of um, spoke about it was that if you just give half or the tip of the iceberg, it forces the reader to use their own imagination to mm. write their own story as you're giving the template. And even in writing, you can have this wonderful dance between author and, and, and reader, like you were suggesting with, you know, the, the, the music flowing with people who've just done it for so long um, that it becomes a, a ceremony, you know. It does. And I love that that picture that you've just placed in my mind because it takes it to another level between author and reader because, you know, the analogy that I was creating was people are present in the same room or on the same field here. You don't even know who the receiver is. And that speaks to that that classic line, the author is dead, mm-hmm. you know, the death of the author. Whoever, do you know who came up with that? No. Uh, but are you familiar with the no. that? That oh, saying, no. no. And the, well, the, the the theory behind the the, the 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 discussion, the death of the author is is it's actually meaningless to a certain degree what the intention behind the words were when they were written down. Mm. The only real meaning is the meaning that is received by the reader. Yeah, because there are two different experiences that are taking place. <clears throat> One. If I if I use your kind of example, is you're taking into account, or Hemingway is taking into account the reader when he's writing the words, but the reader, either consciously or subconsciously, 
may have zero recollection or uh, respect for for, for the for the uh, author itself. Mm-hmm. It's really just about immersing yourself into what um, the words mean to you through your own human existence. You know your your own human um, uh, history. So you know somebody that's lived a traumatic uh, upbringing could read. Um, a story and and get a completely different meaning from somebody who's had a very very um, nurtured and safe upbringing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the only caveat to that, I suppose, is um, when the when when I mean, if you leave if you leave your writing open um, for any interpretation, that then someone who um, you know can take that. And then and and say that you meant A, B, and C. Like when you know Nietzsche's whole philosophy was that um, you you made me think of Nietzsche when you were saying that the author is dead because Nietzsche was this whole was this philosopher that spoke about God being dead or the the concept of God and that everyone can come together under and in service of what this idea of God was. And now that God is dead, we have to find our own values. And, and 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 ideals to pull us forward mm-hmm. and he and he spoke about how there would be two classes of, of of human beings it would be the the superhuman and then the slay and he spoke about slave morality and 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 superhuman morality mm-hmm. and um in part hitler loved nature <laughs> just by the way um doesn't mean nature's bad just mean that hitler loved nature and, <laughs> it's, um, it's, 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 i'm sure he, i'm sure he liked many people <laughs> Be, and you know, in part, Hitler's um, philosophy um, um, came about from this idea of building a superhuman race, as yeah. we can obviously tell. Um, so it's not yeah. always good to just leave it for for any interpretation. But I think I think again, this I mean, we can have a very very deep philosophical conversation around the interplay of yin and yang. But I think whenever you're giving someone an idea that you want to put forward it's giving it within the bounds of where you're trying to take that story. So, mm. so, and JK Rowling did this wonderfully. She got young children to read giant books. Like who the hell does that? No kid wants to read. And she was, Absolutely. and she, she developed this wonderful imagination within the confines of a wizarding world. <laughs> Incredible, right? Just um, phenomenal. Just phenomenal. Yeah. But I mean, to bring that back, I mean, think about what she had to sacrifice to write those books. You know, a lot of us know the story of how many times Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone was rejected. Uh, she was writing in a elephant wheelbarrow, I think the name of the cafe was in Scotland at one point, she couldn't feed her, her kid, you know, everything thrown and a heap of faith to just rely on this one manuscript to, to solve her financial issues. Yeah, pretty incredible. And that goes to show how powerful, um, you know, drive and self-belief and uh almost like not having a a choice in the matter just right. you know mm-hmm. just being pulled so heavily to a path and knowing that this is her truth that yeah. uh you know she was uh, i heard she was living in a car at some stage you, you hear stories about her you yeah. know she was she was a heroin addict. She was selling her children on the street. I heard she was Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but, but but there's that there's that truth that some that resonates so heavily yeah. within a, a single individual that that, that calls them, uh, yeah. which is so powerful. Um, I, I like I'm almost like envious of such a drive and such a um, knowing that uh that is that that is someone's path well mate i mean you and i did an episode a couple of weeks ago on motivation and i think um you know we can often conflate um you know because people say all the time how do i find my purpose how do i know if he or she's the right one um and you know how how do i know if you know Mm -hmm. we never know if because we can't see into the future but what you can do, and it sounds like J.K. Rowling did this um, involuntarily, is create a scenario or set up a situation in life where if you fail, something really bad is going to happen. In other words, you you can't have a plan B. You know, it then sounded what? like for her, it was make or break. So this had to be the best manuscript ever. You know, yep. and 
people talk about burning the boats. Yep. This island has to keep you alive now or, or else you're bugging. And even even um, Tom Billy talks about this who found a quest bars. He, he says that, um, you know, a lot of his um, relational success with, with Lisa and the success of his marriage is kind of grounded upon these really unfavorable um, situations that he puts up um, that would, you know, if, if it led to failure, it'd be the worst thing. I remember him talking about the fact that when they were um, doing some sort of legal thing, he said with his lawyer, can you make the agreement um, really, really bad for me so that she would get all my money or whatever it was if we broke up? And his idea was, I probably wouldn't recommend that for everyone, <laughs> but I suppose his idea was we have to make this relationship really successful. I get it. So I get it. It's kind of cool. I get it because we live in a world, uh, I, I can speak to, to myself as well, I feel like there's been numerous occasions where I've known that there's been security blankets all around me, safety nets everywhere, and that has definitely impacted my my drive, my 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 ability to be completely relentless yep. when it comes to a pursuit down one path. And I think that's that's kind of rife in, in today's society everywhere because we live in such a comfortable world. There's always, and I obviously speak not for everybody here. Of course. But we live in a world where for for many of us, there is a plan B. Yeah. And uh, and for many of us, there is not a plan B. All right. Um, but it, it's I hear tremendous stories about people that overcome hardship and uh, incredible um, situations because there is no plan B. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and that speaks to a very, uh, I mean, just reverse engineer that. If you want more motivation in your life, take away the safety nets. And then it's not about motivation. It's about... Um, exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, why, don't, why don't more people do that? Because it is absolutely scary and it is uncomfortable you know and i think that's just the truth it, it yep. is uncomfortable and i think we have to do that consciously um you know in an educated fashion you know we're not suggesting that you go out there and just you know start living off the street in the hopes that you can write a harry potter <laughs> but um you know you but 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 slowly taking away those comforts that are <clears throat> counterintuitively holding you back is going to be the way that you can level up and, and get close to your, to your goals. I mean, it happened to uh, Sylvester Stallone as well. Right. When he wrote Rocky one, uh, he was living in an apartment, literally the, the length of his bed. He had to sell his dog. Oh my God. Wow. I didn't know that. To wow. Survive. He had to sell his dog to survive. And Hollywood companies eventually took note of script because it is a masterpiece, mm. as you've I've talked to you about. Yes. <laughs> um, and they're like, oh, this is fantastic. We want to buy it from you. We're thinking Burt Reynolds for Rocky. And he's like, no dice. Not going to happen. I'm, I'm your leading man. And they're mm. like, not going to happen. He's like, all right. Yeah. Uh, I saw my dog, but uh, I'm, I'm going to keep keep hunting. I'm going to keep shopping. It was his truth. It was his calling, you know, and um, he eventually got there. Wow. That's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. She's out. I, I struggled to sell my dog, <laughs> but it speaks to how much he wanted that thing. You I know. think he bought his dog back afterwards. Oh, that's good. <laughs> he, he was able to buy his dog back, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Which is... Um, a nice ending to that story. That is a nice ending. Yeah, thank um, God. Amongst the dog's okay. The many billions of dollars he's made as a result. Of <laughs> he's probably bought another Rocky. forty-eight billion dogs. <laughs> he, he can definitely afford a dog. Yes, for the dogs. <laughs> um, and he won an Academy Award for that for that movie. I mean, the nineteen seventy-one, I think it was, Academy Award best film, mm. best film of the year, mm. maybe it was seventy-four. Anyway. Mm. It was, uh, amazing, isn't it? it was incredible. 
It was incredible. I mean, someone should make a movie about that that whole journey of Rocky Balboa. Well, obviously his name's not Rocky Balboa, but of whole of Sylvester Stallone and selling the dog and. But you know, I was as you were talking, well, it's about, like, pursuit of happiness, right? Like, <laughs> right. it is to a degree, yeah. Well, yeah, to a yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a good question for people. We can kind of finish on this. <clears throat> is more often than not, at least I believe anyway, we don't actually know what we want. What we want is implicit in our behavior across time. So what you might start doing, and obviously this is this is a dynamic thing because sometimes people do make those changes and they do achieve things that they didn't think they were capable of. But when you think about what you want and what your goals are, the next question would be not necessarily how wonderful it would be to have those things, although pleasure is a wonderful motivational force, but thinking about what you're going to need to give up in order to get those things. And if you're willing to do that, that can help you become clearer on what it is that you want. Yeah, it's powerful and it's resonating and it's uncomfortable to actually think about because as we've talked about in the past, we're living in a world where we like to think about all the warm and fuzzy uh, power of attraction, positive reinforcement. But the reality is scary shit gets you off your ass. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly right, man. I love that. That's a good way to win it. Love that. Okay, thanks, guys, and I hope you enjoyed our chat. Um, It was definitely not what we intended to talk (laughs) about, but I'm happy we talked about it. (laughs) Same here, Paulie. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon.